is it feels like certain scientists and writers have gotten the point of what you're trying to get across kind of directly and maybe do you think those writers and scientists have been more functional in the world because they've been connected to the same ideas? Well, many times these people tend to be ignored for a while, and then they tend to be neglected for a while, and then once they start to become influential in some way, they start to be get persecuted. So I guess that's the crowd I've been quoting a lot, if that makes any sense. So there are certain scientists and others that have returned to this understanding of the world as a unified whole, like James Lovelock with the Gaia theory. And I've seen that students respond very strongly, very positively to this, because in the case of students that have had some background in hard sciences, this provides a unifying scope. It provides a unifying framework where the ecology becomes global and you start understanding the whole Earth system as a unified whole, and you start kind of seeing that climate change starts making sense in this context. So the reason why I bring these things in is that Many times they provide context for things that students might have learned in other places. So that's how I try to connect these things, and also historically. I see it as being very important to put things in historical context, and that is also very much overlooked in our education today, higher education in specific, because students get, I mean, compartmentalized pictures of I mean, the historical framework for whatever they have been doing. And then they just leave it after the introductory course. But I see the need to return to this, to provide an understanding of why the historical context has evolved as it has, and how this has impacted whatever problems we are studying or whatever topics the students are being introduced to. So the historical uh, points where things are being put in the historical context, I see that students respond very positively to this. Like, like what? Like, for instance, um, understanding the historical well, watershed event, almost, when you had the reductionistic philosophers, Francis Bacon, who is also the father of the scientific method, and René Descartes on one side of the spectrum and Spinoza on the other. And you see that the Western civilization, to a very large extent, sided with the Cartesian, Baconian Cartesian kind of perspective and how this historically became a justification for the Industrial Revolution and a lot of things that followed, with all the sustainability impacts that have come from this. So understanding where the rationalizations philosophically come from is important for students to make sense of why these things have really taken off, why these things have become our Western history. And this is something that many times is sorely missing in the United States, here in the education you have you don't really see this historical integration of providing this context, this scope. Because all things come not out of a vacuum, but rather from a process of developments. Is it different in Europe? To some extent, yes. A at least it used to be. Here, education is very, very much integrated with a system that needs to deliver utility. It needs to deliver results. You get an education, you pay a lot of tuition, and you need to go out there and get a job. And that presupposes, basically, that you need to be part of the system. So that's why the education becomes very focused on understanding and learning the system as it is today, rather than changing it. Because if you become one of those people that are the rebels and that want to change everything, then you become a danger to the system that is already in place. But that's where the creativity comes in. That's where the system changes. So it's a little bit of a paradox there, as you can see. You've said that music is an intuitive rendition of complex systems. I gave a talk on this a year ago, and that was specifically the classical music of Gustav Mahler. So that was a very specific form of music. And as I see it, Gustav Mahler in his symphonies and in his songs, he provides a language in music that is very different from other compositions, from other forms of music. And he said that the symphony must be like the world. It must contain everything. So he had this extremely unified scope and this awareness that his music must illustrate everything in all of its complexity, 
both the ugly and the beautiful and so forth. So his music is very different and he looks at things or he explains things in this tonal language in ways that are very different from most other forms of music. You don't think Mozart expresses the world? Yes, I do. Mozart is also a very good example of this. But I think that Mahler expressed this in a very pedagogic way almost. And his symphonies have this explicit focus. But Mozart's music contains everything too, of course. It's perfect. Mozart, by the way, is my absolute favorite. I think he's perfect too. Yes. Can you tell me what you're planning for the future? You're an educator now. Do you ever plan to leave education or do you plan to, to, to stay with an American academic system and foster the change you want to see? Well, at the present point in time, I'm looking for uh, some place where I can realize this vision of education. And it doesn't necessarily have to be academia as I see it. And there are some things that indicate that it might necessarily not be in academia because there is a lot of resistance to these actual changes. But I want to educate people wherever they are interested in listening to these kinds of things and where they are interested in engaging. So as I see it, the important thing is to find a platform for a revolution in education, how we see ourselves not only as educators and students, but also as citizens. As I see it, education needs to go back to the Socratic ideal of being the midwife to the potential in the person. And that is also something I talk about in my lectures, about the Renaissance ideal of education, where higher education was perceived to be universal education. That was the ideal. You wanted to become the man of the universe, the one that understands things in a truly functional way, like Leonardo da Vinci, who is, of course, the best example of this. But after this, education took off in a very different angle, in a very different direction. So education became all about specialization. But in the Renaissance, specialization was the special case. If you needed specialization, you went in that direction. But you did so only after you had the universal education. So I want to go back to this Renaissance ideal of education. And not only education serving the needs of the system as it is now, but something else, something new. And I know there are many people that work on this and that want to be part of this revolution, but many times they are the downtrodden ones. They are the ones that do not get tenure. They are the ones that are not being considered the good educators because they are not part of the structure that is in place. So if we really want system change, we need to think in new ways. We need to really start seeing things in new ways or unlearn the wrong ways. It sounds like a colossal challenge. Are you not, uh, are you not uh, concerned about how you're going to approach this systemic international change? Well, all true change is, of course, daunting, right? All things um, difficult are always, I mean, truly difficult. But education needs to start serving the purposes of actually engaging with the real world as it is in all of its complexity. And if we're only stuck in this Cartesian anxiety of having to learn everything and become the expert and just go down in the trench of one discipline, if we teach our children that this is the ideal of becoming the expert at the expense of understanding the wider scope, then all expertise will only be detrimental. If expertise is to be serving the needs we have for true change in the world for the better, no matter which area you look at, Expertise needs to become put, become, I mean, introduced into the wider scope, and that's what I call transdisciplinarity. The understanding that the specialization is a special case. You need it, yes, but you do not need it in isolation only. It needs to be contained within a meaningful context where it serves certain purposes. And today, academia and other forms of education serves the purpose to a very large extent of teaching children just to either disconnect at an early stage or become interested in just one part of the whole puzzle, one piece, and go down into that trench and get lost in the process. As soon as so, possible. As soon as possible, yes. So in other words, it's a system that is doomed to fail, and it is failing. And I think that part of this failure is showing itself in the sustainability crisis we have. 
because we have taught generation after generation how to derive human benefits at the expense of the natural world, at the expense of social justice and so forth. And now we really need to think over this again and say, how did we end up in this mess? And that's where sustainability education comes in. That's where it becomes relevant. And in the end, of course, all education needs to become sustainability education. But of course that is far off. But getting there, I mean, we need to take certain steps and I try to provide my piece in this. What do your critics say? Well, many times they say that I'm not an expert, I don't have the right to speak about certain things, and so forth. I don't have the credentials within that system. But as I see it, we need to have functional understanding, and that's where I'm trying to come in into this picture. And I don't have aspirations being this expert necessarily. I mean, of course you need certain expertise in a lot of different areas. You need certain knowledge and a certain breadth and depth in many areas in order for you to become an effective educator if you really want to provide scope. But some people say that, well, you're only a dilettante. But some people say it's more in the, in the direction of a Renaissance man. But I guess that's in the eye of the beholder. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks for coming to talk to me. It's been great. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.